We serve a miraculous God who does miraculous things. Amen. He operates in realms that sometimes we, we, don't, give him a, we don't give him credit for. And, uh, you know, just like Bobby said, you know, it was like she, you can have faith and you have faith and you're holding on to this faith and all of a sudden you're thrown into a severe crisis and it's right before your eyes and it's just like, no, this is real. This is real. Well, God is real. Amen. God is real. And he's bigger and he can do above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. Amen? Amen. And uh, I'm thankful for that. I want to, we're, we're approaching... Uh, what's called Holy Week, or Easter Week, and I want to share with you uh, what I've entitled today, a message I've entitled today, the Gethsemane Experience, the Gethsemane Experience. I want to, I want to uh, maybe make a statement here that's fairly strong, that if there wasn't a Gethsemane, there wouldn't have been a Calvary. If there wasn't a Gethsemane, there wouldn't have been a Calvary. Gethsemane is is a place on the Mount of Olives, and the word itself implies a press. Or, and as probably most of you know, that olives were very uh, needed at this particular time and and utilized in in a variety of ways. But one of the ways was getting oil from the olives that they used for a variety of purposes. And to get the oil from the olives, there was a huge, a huge press that would press the olives to get the oil out of them. Gethsemane was the place on the Mount of Olives that alluded to the fact of it being a press or an olive press. And this was the place that Jesus took his disciples after he had spent some time with him, them uh, sharing the Last Supper, which was also the Feast of Passover. He took them to this place of Gethsemane. This was the last time uh, prior to the crucifixion that he was to spend this intimate time with his, with his disciples. I want to just take a few minutes today, and I want to reflect on some of the events that happened in Gethsemane, and I want to show you some parallels that apply to you and I today. Amen? You with me? Let's take this journey together. First of all, some pre-Gethsemane activities that were taking place, Jesus was involved with his, his friends, his disciples, individuals that he had lived with, ministered with, uh, had all kinds of encounters with for the last three years of his life. And they were gathered together and they were sharing the Passover meal in a very intimate setting. Jesus discussed some upcoming events, events with his disciples. He told them of his betrayal, um, which was eventually by Judas. He told them that there was going to be a time when they would all be offended and they would all, they would all depart. And uh, his disciples at that particular time professed allegiance and they, they told Jesus, you know what, we're not, we're with you to the end. We're your friends, we're going to be there with you. And that's when Jesus told Peter, he said, uh, you're going to even deny me three times before morning or three times before the cock crows. I want to read you a little bit of this. If you have your Bibles, I'll be in Matthew, the 26th chapter. It says then, starting at verse 36, then cometh Jesus with them unto the place called Gethsemane. And so after... Jesus had participated with his disciples, and after Jesus had shared with him these intimate things, he shared with them about the new covenant that was going to be in his blood, um, instituted the, what, we, what we call the ordinance of communion, um, shared with them that there was going to be a, a departure, that they were going to be offended because of him, and they, it was just a, it was quite an uh, encounter that they shared with one another. It's at this point in verse Matthew 26, starting in verse 36, that Jesus took his disciples and they came unto a place called Gethsemane. And he said unto his disciples, sit you here while I go pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further, and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, 
If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And, it, and he cometh unto his disciples, and he found them asleep. And he said unto Peter, Couldn't you even watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time, and he prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them, and he went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, and he said unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves, from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave him a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus, and he said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they, and they laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them that was there with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck a servant of the high priest, and smote his ear off. And said Jesus unto him, put, put your sword away, for all that take up the sword are going to perish with the sword. Thinkest thou not that I could not pray my father, and he would presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? And how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be? In the same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and stave for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. Verse 56, But all this was done that the scripture of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. I want to also refer to you to a passage of Luke that gives a few more insights as to this event. Starting at verse 39 of chapter 22 of Luke. And he came out and he went as he wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And he, when he was at, a pl- at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and he kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he arose from prayer, and he was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he yet speak, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. Verse 48, But Jesus said unto him, Judas, Betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus, as you can see, after after he had spent this time with his disciples, his last supper, the Passover meal, he got up and he went to the Mount of Olives to the place called Gethsemane. He separated himself at that particular time from all of his disciples, taking with him his inner circle, so to speak, his closest friends, Peter, James, and John. And they went forth to pray. They, he went forth to pray. They, they accompanied him. It says in Scripture that he was very heavy and sorrowful. And he asked his three friends to be with him during this time of crisis that he was going through in his life. And so Jesus separated himself a little ways from those three closest friends that were with him in this particular part of Gethsemane, and Jesus began to pray, asked his three friends to be there to support support him, and and 
he was praying and he came back and he was very disappointed, to say the least, in finding out their lack of commitment to him because instead of staying with him during this time of trial and this time of sorrow, they had fallen asleep. It says that this time of intensity that Jesus was going through actually made his sweat as if it were blood. And there is, I've been told, in the medical world, a condition that results from the breaking of capillaries because of intense stress. When a person is going through intense, intense stress or in, intense eternal turmoil, sometimes those little capillaries will burst. And when they burst, it's like it, it mixes with your sweat, and it's almost as if you're sweating blood. And so this indeed could have been the case with Jesus, as his sweat appeared to be as blood. Jesus was asking God, and I want you to hear this, Jesus was asking God to get him out of a difficult situation. He came to him and he said, God, if there is any way possible, please take this cup from me. It was causing him great stress, great sorrow, great internal turmoil. And he said, God, take this cup from me. But he also went on to say this, and he, he suffixed what he had said, take this cup from me, with the statement, nevertheless, nevertheless, I am willing to drink this cup. I am willing to do your will whatever that may be. It is my desire, it's the desire of my flesh for me to not have to go through the pain, not have to go through the crucifixion, not have to be nailed to the cross. It's my desire that I, I, don't, have, I don't want to do these things, but I want to do your will. And so there's this internal turmoil that was going on. But Jesus won the victory there in Gethsemane. As he submitted his own will to the will of the Father. Does everybody see that? He submitted his own will, his own desire to the will of the the Father. You know, it goes on later, and we just read, that Jesus knew that he he could have at any time had 12 legions of angels there at any time. He could have been out of the situation that he was in. And yet, he submitted to the will of the Father. Jesus returned from the prayer, and he finds his disciples sleeping again. And then one of his closest friends at least one that had spent three years with him, one of the twelve, Judas by name, came forward and kissed Jesus. And Jesus made that statement to Judas, and I, I believe it echoes through the hallways of history, even to us today. He says, Judas, you're betraying me with a kiss? You're betraying me with a kiss? I believe he was saying along these lines, he said, why are you using the sign of affection as a tool of betrayal? Why didn't you just say, he who I spit in his face, that's him. Or he who I go up and punch, that's the one. I think at this particular time, it would more have reflected the condition of Judas's heart. But Judas went forth and he used the false sign of affection as a tool of betrayal. Judas, betrayest thou me with a kiss? It was at that point his disciples all fled away. And Jesus was arrested and taken before Caiaphas. We're all familiar with that. We've read it before. We've read about these events. But I want to show you some parallels today. Maybe some parallels that you and I can relate to. Hopefully. 
First of all, the pre-Gethsemane activities, I would say that these were times of interaction and fellowship. This is, in a sense, our pre-Gethsemane activities as our involvement with our friends, our, our gathering together in church, in, in worshiping God, and in, in hearing the word preached, and in, in hearing what is shared. I mean, this is exactly what his disciples had encountered. This is exactly what their experience was. They heard Jesus, they heard his word, they, they participated with him in these events. They heard the truth, and, and many of them, as, as you and I, made verbal commitments. Man, I'm in this all the way. I'm going to sing these songs because you know why? Jesus is my Lord and he's my Savior. And they said it to, the, they said it to Jesus' face there prior to Gethsemane as they gathered for Passover. They said, you know what? No matter what happens to you, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be by your side. And Jesus said, you're all going to leave me. And, they, and Peter said, if everyone leaves you, it's certainly not going to be me. And, and Jesus looked at Peter and he said, before the cock crows, in other words, before morning, you're going to deny me three times. Three times. I think maybe we need to hear what Jesus is saying to us today. And maybe his words are echoing through the hallways of history, the words that he shared with his disciples as they gathered for Passover and as we gather here today on this Sunday morning to declare our allegiance. I mean, we could have been a lot of places, but we chose to be in church. And we could have been doing a lot of things even during church, but we chose to sing and to praise his name. Amen? We chose to be here to hear his word. We've chose these things. And we're, and we're making that statement, yes, I'm with the Lord. I'm with the Lord all the way because he's my Lord and Savior. I think most of us recognize that it's very hard to uh, have one if you don't have the other. It's very hard to have a Savior if he's not your Lord. Right? That having Jesus as our Savior, we have a born-again experience that makes him our Lord, that we've committed our lives to him. Amen? And we receive what he's done. And so we make that statement, but maybe as Jesus was telling his disciples, maybe he's telling that to us today. He says, you know what? You call me Lord, and you call me Savior, but you're going to betray me today. You're going to deny me when you go out to the restaurant. You're going to go home, and all of a sudden your activities are going to portray something different than I'm your Lord. You're going to continue living, living a lifestyle of your own goals and your own agendas and your own desires, and you're going to forget all about this proclamation that you're making today. And if he were here to tell us that, hope most of us probably would protest. And we would say, oh, not me. It might be someone else, but not me. I'm going to be there to the end. What he was making his disciples aware of, and I believe what we need to be aware of as well, is as though, although our spirits are willing, there's a battle going on. And our spirits are encased in vessels of flesh. And in, in so being, there's a warfare that goes on between the spirit and the directions that God wants us to go and the directions that our flesh wants to go. I don't even have to, I'm not telling you anything profound because you're more of an, ex, just as, you're more of an expert on you than I am. <laughs> you know what's going on in your own life. You know the situations in your life. You know the battle that rages. I think Paul accurately alludes to this in Romans chapter 7 where he simply says, you know what, I have these aspirations of things that I want to do and I end up doing things that are contradictory to them. And the things that I know I should do, I'm not doing. And the things that I know I shouldn't do, I end up doing. He basically is saying, who is going to deliver me from this body of death? The turmoil he was, he was portraying there. Then he went on to say that my victory is in Christ alone. 
My victory is in Christ. So Jesus prophesied and told the disciples they were going to leave, they were going to depart, and uh, I believe that that's echoing through the, today as well. And I'll, I'll tell you, it doesn't necessarily have to be a prophecy, it can actually be an observation. And you don't have to look at your neighbor or your friend, you can just look in the mirror yourself. You can basically say, you know what, what I've proclaimed today, what I've declared today, what I've sung today, all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. All my hope is in Jesus. I've been washing the blood. We're singing that. We're proclaiming that. We're excited about it. And yet, is all your hope really in Jesus? Are you really thankful that yesterday's gone, or is your focus on recreating yesterday's? And Jesus, it says there, as he went to Gethsemane, went to this place of the press. I want you to see this. He, he brought with him three individuals that we'll just call his inner circle. We all have that inner circle. We learn about it at Teen Challenge in our personal relationships with others class. But there are different levels of friendship. There's acquaintances, and we all have a lot of those, don't we? In fact, everybody in here is probably an acquaintance of one another to some degree. And then we go to the next phase, which is a casual friend. And a casual friend is not just someone that you've seen before, but someone you may know their name and you may have, and all of a sudden your list gets a little shorter, right? You have a whole lot of acquaintances, but when it comes down to casual friends, there's a whole lot fewer. And then in the midst of those casual friends, there's a few that you would call close friends. And those close friends are people that you can share a little bit more about personal things that are going on in your life. People that, are, uh, that care for you and will be with you. And then the list gets very, very small when we enter into those that we could actually call intimate friends. In fact, it's even suggested that you might only have one or two intimate friends for the, your entire life. But an intimate friend is that person that you can really sit down and share goals and aspirations and desires, that you can share failures and hurts and pains, someone that's going to be there with you and comfort you and strengthen you during those times of frustration. Everybody, we all know that, right? And we've seen that. We may have not identified it as such. But we know that there are individuals that we have deeper relationships with. I would say that Peter, James, and John had entered into that intimate circle with Jesus. These were individuals that he, he knew that during his time of sorrow, during his time of pain, he needed those, those to be there to strengthen him and to support him during this time. I'm going through a crisis, and I need you. What, what happened, of course, is, is that he needed them to be there just to strengthen him, just to be there to encourage, that, encourage him during this time. And I, I tell you, we've been there, and I, 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 if I can just give you maybe an analogy that could help us understand it, this is, could be the person that's just lost a loved one or a friend, and they're, you're, they're sitting in the, in the funeral parlor, and uh, they've asked a few people to be there with them because I'm going through a whole lot in my life right now. And I, I, don't, I, I don't need your counsel, and I don't need, I don't need any kind of uh, biblical advice. I just need you. I just want your presence there with me. And maybe some of you have experienced that. And it would be like those friends that you invited say, you know what, I'd really like to be there, Tom. But I got another appointment. Or, I, I, or the person that does show up, and, 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 and they're just there for a few moments, and then they leave, and, and, and you feel like, you needed someone so desperately and, and so importantly in your life at that particular time, and yet they let you down, or you feel let down. It was a tough time for me not too long ago when I went through this crisis with the uh, uh, sheriff's department in this crazy, crazy 
situation that occurred. And it, it, really, it really did something to me. It really, it, not only did it aggravate me, it did some things. And I, 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 I remember individuals telling me, you know, you know we're behind you. <laughs> we're behind you in this. We're behind you in this. We're right behind you. And uh, in some of those cases, I felt like, yeah, they're behind me all right, way behind me. And I'm up here all by myself. And I just needed some friends and some comfort, you know, during, during this time of, uh, which was great stress. And I know that we've all experienced that to some, de- some degree. And at this particular time, Jesus had called forth his friends and they came forward. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we can glean from this, and I want you to glean from it, as close as your friends are, that's not where your comfort's going to be found. They don't fully understand your battle. They don't fully understand those things that you're going through. As, as clear as you try to make it, they don't understand it. It's a battle that you're going to have to fight alone. It's a Gethsemane experience that you're going to have to deal with. Because the battle that's raging inside of you, the bad battle that's going on inside of you, it's, it's a battle between you submitting totally to God... Or you continue doing things your own way and looking for those things that are comfortable in your life. And even though this battle is raging and you're experiencing some of the outward consequences, maybe you're going through discouragement and depression and you're experiencing some of these outward symptoms, they are just symptoms of what's going on inside right now. It's a battle. And I'll tell you, some individuals, as they, as they, they cry out to God and they, you know, they want God to, to deliver, deliver them from the, bat, from the situation, from the pain, but they don't recognize the fact that it's a battle that's going to cr- require surrender for you to really experience the presence of God in your life and what He wants to do in your life. You know what happens today is, is that this battle is very seldom even fought. It's lived with, and people walk around in perpetual turmoil and discouragement and frustration. They walk around having these things still raging on the inside and yet not fighting the battle and gaining the victories. They experience the consequences of those things going on. And it's, it's like trying to, it's trying to walk the fence line. It's trying to walk with with uh, you know, one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the, in the world. It's trying to tell God, I'm willing to give you my whole life, and then just saying, as long as you're not asking for this or that or the other thing. You see, I still have my own goals, and I still have my own plans, and I still have my own desires, and those are the things that I, I, I really want to do. And Lord, please, just allow me to have my own desires. These are what I want to have. Please, Lord, give me this job. Give me more money. Heal my body. Do this. Give me this person as a spouse. Do this for me. Do that for me. I I need these things, Lord. It'll bring me happiness. Oh, Lord, these are the things that I want. And you're going through these things and you're begging God and you're fighting for these things that you want when He's waiting for you to surrender those things. And come to Him and, and be able to say, although these are the things that I want, I am willing to surrender them for the things that you want. No matter what they are. I am not going to put any conditions on them. You know what? This is what Jesus went through. And this is what you and I need to recognize. He went through something here. He was a man. He was humanity. Although he was God, he was encased in the vessel of a man. He was fully man, just as he was fully God. And as a man, he was going through some of those same things that you and I go through. What he was experiencing was this. He was experiencing, I don't want to go through the pain of betrayal. I don't want my friends leaving me. I don't want to die. I want to to live. I want to continue my life. These are the things that I want. And as he went before the Lord and he simply said, God, 
And, and you can see the parallel. Oh God, I just want a better job. I just want more money in my life. I just want this situation changed, that situation changed. I want to be more comfortable, Lord. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad that Jesus was willing to forsake his comfort when he said, although I want you to take the cup from me, I am willing to drink it. Although this is what I want, I'm willing to do what you want. Unfortunately, I think that this portrays something that's very neglected in our lives today. It's almost as if our salvation implies that we get whatever we want. That God's our genie, and all of a sudden He's our genie in a bottle, and all we have to do is, now that we're saved, He's just going to give us whatever we want. Well, Jesus portrays something totally different. He says, my relationship with God puts me in a position where I am willing to surrender what I want for the furtherance of God's kingdom. This is heavy. That's why it's a press. That's why it was called Gethsemane. It was a press. It was the time of surrender. I don't think Jesus just... I don't think these are recorded in Scripture just to give a historical analysis of what went on. I believe it's also to give us a, a guideline as to how we, too, can get victory over those ragings within us for our own comfort and for our own desires. And it's when we get to that point in our lives where we basically surrender what we want to what God wants. And this is, this is the masquerade. We try to pretend what we want is what God wants. And we got to get to that point where we have a Gethsemane experience where we enter into the press. We said, this turmoil that's going on, this is where it ends. I do have the passions. I do have the desires. I do have the interests. But today, today, Lord, I lay them down. And whatever, however you you want to write the rest of the story. I'm laying my pen down. And no longer is it going to be my autobiography. It's going to be your biography of me. I'm laying my pen down. I'm no longer going to write it. And whatever it is, if you're calling me to the mission field, I am going to quit using excuses why I can't go. If you're telling me there's sin in my life that I need to quit doing, I am no longer going to legitimize that sin. If you're telling me that there are areas in my life, activities in my life that you want me to participate in so that I will grow and mature as a Christian, I will no longer make excuses as to why I can't do them because I am going to lay them down and I'm going to say, God, although I have other interests, other desires, other passions, I'm going to surrender them in the press so that I can come out pure and be who you want me to be. I surrender them to you, Lord. I'm going to go where you want me to go. I'm going to say what you want me to say. I'm going to be who you want me to be. And it will be not because of my desires, my interests. It's going to be because of your calling. It's hard for us. I think Jesus demonstrated something that's so hard for us today. We have a hard time separating that. 
we have a hard time separating our own interests and our own desires. And it's just like, well, we serve a God. He wants us to be happy. He wants us... Well, yes, there's no doubt that He created you to experience joy and happiness in your life. There's no doubt about that. But there's something way more important than your joy and happiness. And that's your obedience and your surrender to the one for whom all things exist. It's not an easy, it's not an easy solution. I can, I can ask you for a show of hands how many of you are willing to do it, and we'll all raise our hands because we just don't want to be the one person that says, yeah, I want to follow Jesus, but not really. It's a, it's a process. The press is a process of your life. And as you grow and mature, as you're in that press, all of a sudden, your own interests and your own desires become less and less as you're surrendering to Him and to what He wants for your life. The cock is crowing. You know, don't Tell him he's your Lord in church today and live like he's just a secondary thought tomorrow. Don't tell me that you've committed your whole life or tell him you've committed your whole life to him and then live your whole life for yourself. I believe the church, I believe for revival to occur in your life, in our lives, in in, in our corporate lives, for revival to occur, we need to go through the press And we need to start saying, you know what, it's no longer... I'm not making decisions based on my financial conditions. I'm not basing decisions based on the desires of my family or friends. I'm not basing decisions based on what looks like it's going to be the most profitable, the most comfortable, the most enjoyable. I'm going to start basing my decisions on what you want me to do, no matter what it is. I'm going to drink the cup. I want you to take it from me. But more importantly than taking it from me, I want you to give me the strength to drink it. 